Hi everyone. I hope you're having a really good week and a nice weekend. Enjoying the Olympics, I hope. They're amazing. Boy, the energy those people put into this. It's stunning. Today, we're going to talk about presentation boards. This is a great topic for Common Core writing standards. It fits perfectly in with that. It also fits really well in if you follow responsive classroom sort of ideas where you warm the class up and do some things at the beginning of class to get students ready to learn. This is perfect for that. It takes five or 10 minutes at the beginning of class and gets everyone in the mood for technology, for all the wonders that go along with technology. So these are three boards you'll probably find are soon your favorites. But let me back up a minute, introduce myself. My name is Jackie Murray. I teach K through eight technology. I teach in the classroom. I also go into the grade level classrooms and work with the teachers there to integrate technology into their lesson plans, into their curriculum, their standards. I work with faculty. I work with administrators and schools to integrate technology into Common Core standards. It's an important part of the Common Core, but it's not another layer. It's just not one more thing you have to learn because darn Common Core, it's making you do all this stuff on top of what you normally do. It, it's not that. And if anyone's telling you it is, they, they have them come talk to me. Con Technology is a tool used with Common Core to implement the standards. The standards are to go along with your curriculum. So what I do is I go into a school and I show them how to use technology as Common Core wants it to make their standards, their curriculum work more efficiently. I also do a lot of mentoring and coaching with teachers. I have a webinars and um, I have a summer workshop coming up, different things like that. So I work a lot with teachers like we're doing here and um, develop ideas and answer questions, which I hope you'll post your questions on our stream. This lesson today is a very cool lesson. You will love it. It's so student oriented, so student directed, and it expects a lot of those integral learning skills out of students that you, it, it, sometimes it's hard to teach. Like you wanna teach students to get things done quickly, understand the idea of deadlines, of prioritizing items, but it's hard to teach that because you don't wanna say only spend 10 minutes on your math because you also want them to spend as much time as they need to. This sort of approach where it's, quick research or I'll, I'll, Common Core says conduct short as well as more sustained research projects based on focused questions, demonstrating understanding of the subject under investigation. Well, that part about short is very important because most people don't have an infinite amount of time. Students have to learn to get everything done in whatever time they have. This sort of a project helps them do that because it's pretty painless, it's quick, and it, you have a lot of help on it. So I love this for that reason. What we're going to do is research a variety of topics. And we have three different boards students do. I usually do them one per grading period. Um, if you have four grading periods, so you can kind of stretch them out, do them whatever way you want. But if you have three, this is perfect. One per grading period. So they prepare, research, and present in each grading period. And because they're so short, I usually get three done in a week. So if your week is, if your grading period is 10 weeks or 15 weeks, you've got plenty of time to get all the students done in that amount of time, even with recess and snow days and things like that where you miss time. So you um, research topics quickly, finding the right information strategically and effectively. I don't want students to research a long time. Uh, first thing I want them to do for all three of these topics is to go to what they already know and pull their information from that, to talk to friends and get information from their friend, but then test it make sure it works. 
Don't just say, I remember I did it this way once. Okay, there we go. Test it just as you would any other time. Make sure it works before you present it to your classmates. Share results with classmates. And the, th the three topics we're going to include here, the first one is going uh, Google Earth Tours. Students will pick one site on Google Earth. They'll be in charge of their classmates. They'll use the smart screen. They'll open up Google Earth and take classmates to that location on Google Earth. They'll tell them one fascinating fact about that location. To do that, they'll have to go into the um, dialog box and, and write it. We'll get into that in a minute. And then they'll take questions. The second one is problem solving. They'll have one problem that is a common one students face using technology, and they'll tell classmates the solution for it. They only have to give one solution, but I don't want it to be the solution that no one will probably get to. I want it to be the one they'll probably want to start with. And then they'll take questions. The third one is vocabulary. Now this can be technology vocabulary. I call it speak like a geek when we do that. So they can take those vocabulary words that as you're teaching, you use certain terminology, your domain specific vocabulary. Well, sometimes students understand it, sometimes they don't. So this is a chance to have take collect all those words, have students teach each other how to use them. So those are the three topics. So let me see. Skill level, you, you really need only the basics an understanding of how to use the internet, how to stand up and talk in front of people. This doesn't require anything spectacular. It's geared for third through seventh grade. Third is early, seventh is kind of, okay, we've done this, we know this, this is easy. So might only be sixth grade. Third grade, because you want them to get that knowledge and reinforce it every year by seventh grade, they, they've got it. So those are the age groups it's beginning, it's geared for. Now, I, always in my lessons, I use back channel devices. So open up your back channel, whatever that might be. That could be uh, Socrative or Today's Meet. It could simply be your class Twitter account where it's open on the smart screen and students then comment as they're going through. If, uh, if a classmate makes a presentation for Speak Like a Geek and the word is icon and the student says, hashtag speak like a geek, I didn't understand the definition. Then the student knows right away it didn't get through. Now you wanna review speaking and listening skills with students. So they know that the, the questions they ask are tied into what's being talked about and they are honest and rele relevant so we don't waste anyone's time. So I get those back channel devices working. It could also be something like Google Forms. If you're in fifth grade and up, they could have a Google Apps for Education, and you might just have a form opened on Google where they post their question, and that stays up on the smart screen, and everyone sees, okay, there's that question. And then someone goes in and posts the answer. Hopefully not you, but Eventually it would have to be you, but hopefully one of the students goes in and posts the answer. So you get your back channel device working and let's see, the, the, the research you're asking them to do on these is nominal. You really don't want them researching. I, I will go into how to do that at each level, but it's mostly going to come from their knowledge. You want it almost a summative assessment or formative assessment of what they've learned. Transfer that knowledge to this useful situation. So remind them of that, that you do not expect or want them to spend a lot of time researching. Preparation and, and the presentation also should be using what they already know about the presentations. It's three minutes. They're going to stand up. They're going to introduce themselves. They're going to explain what they're doing, give an answer, take audience questions. It's very simple. Just that order of things. 
So this is maybe something they've done often in class. It's not going to be a long one like they have to do sometimes in class. So that's why I say this. I want them to draw on their other speaking and listening experiences and use them right here. This is the time to practice them, not to research, not to anything else. They can take notes up, by the way, as a presenter. I'm perfectly fine with that. Okay, sign up for these. I do sometimes put sign up sheets on the wall, but really a better approach is to do it through an online form because that way students can go and check to see if when was my date and what's my question. You aren't the repository of that knowledge. It's not unavailable to them when your room is locked. So I encourage you to use something like, it could be a sign up genius, but it very nicely can work on Google Apps. If, if you have that account for all the students, it's real simple. Have them put it right on the calendar. This is my date, this is my topic, it's right there. Or set up a separate form. You can use Google Spreadsheets. You don't even have to use forms. Just use Google Spreadsheets and have them put in order, this is my date, this is my topic. And then it's shared with everyone. So everyone knows you aren't responsible for reminding them or telling them. And if they're home and they're going, oh my goodness, am I tomorrow? Then they look it up on, in the cloud. So these are much better solutions. I, I would share with you the sign-up sheets I put on the wall, but I don't want you to use them. I want you to use these online approaches. So if you are really desperate and you can't use those, send me a note and I'll give you the, the ones that you stick on the wall and everyone has to take a picture of. I've had parents take pictures of them and then they know exactly. Homeroom moms take pictures and then they take on the responsibility of telling all the students when they're due. And that's very nice of them, but we want to discourage that. Okay, so that's how we sign up. And we've talked about the research. Okay, here's an overview of how this goes. The student selects the presentation date from and, and posts it. And they also select their problem that they're going to solve. I do let them work in groups, but they each have to have their own topic. Work in groups meaning they'll all go up at the same time and they can pitch in and help each other. If someone has the speak like a geek vocabulary word and they're up there and they forget it, one of the other people in their group can answer for them and no one loses any credit. So I do allow them to work in groups, but they have to organize that group. I don't want them to stand up there and giggle and kick their feet and stuff. I want them to be organized. Okay. Where can they get help? They can get help by researching. That's okay, quickly. And I'll show you some specific areas when we get into the topics. They can get help by website help files, family and friends, classmates. They can come to you as a last resort because it's important since everyone's listening to their answers, it's important that the class gets the information. So they can come and you will make sure they have the information, but they can't ask you the day they're presenting. Believe me, I have people doing that. It always amazes me. I, I actually tell them I can't do that. They walk in class, say, Mrs. Murray, my presentation's today. What's this mean? You're too late. I can't help you. They have to come the day before, at least the morning. So let them know that you are available, but under the correct terms. So you, student must be prepared. Now, if you go through the speaking and listening skills under Common Core and go through those with the students, they're, they're very good. They give you lots of good ideas for, you show up prepared to do your job. You don't just show up and then prepared goes without saying. No, Common Core points out you go show up prepared, which means research done, notes in hand. You know it's your date. So remind students. You might even have those Common Core listening and speaking skills on your wall for them to refer to. And the presentation style is adapted to the audience. It's formal in an essence. It's not informal. They don't use slang. They don't use acronyms. 
they use full words, they use full sentences, but it's not formal that they have to use big words. They use a conversational style, but no, no slang. So review that with them so that you can, they'll, they'll follow that. They don't want to telegraph if they're nervous. So they, they want to make sure that they don't have any of those nervous actions that happen, playing with their hair, giggling, wiggling, whatever they do. Ask them, what kind of things do you do when you're new, nervous? They love that. And have them tell them, all. okay, those are all the things you don't do. You stand up there calmly. You look the audience in the eye. You speak loud enough the person in the back of the room can hear you, and then you go. So remind them. That's what we're doing it like. No ums, no stuttering, none of that stuff. Okay. The speaker does take questions from the audience. And then the audience follows the correct speaking and listening rules. They ask questions related to the topic. They don't ask goofy questions. If they're in third grade, they're really going to want to ask a goofy question, but they, they can't, not in this situation. So they ask appropriate questions, and the presenter answers if it's on their question. They try to answer if it's related, but they don't have to. Now, it, we, we want to respond to all inquiry. So if the audience asks a question that's related and the speaker doesn't know, you may take other people in the audience and ask them to answer it. You may also answer it because it's something that students are curious about. So you want to always jump in on those. Okay, so then this entire thing takes about three minutes. That's really all it takes. They stand up, they introduce themselves, they make the presentation, they take questions, they sit down. So it's not a long thing. You grade them while they're talking. So it's not a lot for you either. Make your grading as simple as possible because you don't want to have to try to remember. You want to do it as they're talking and be done with it, move on. Okay, so our first board. Now, I'll tell, I've interrupted myself. I hate when I do that. But I'm going to give you all of these notes that you on our stream. So you'll get all of these. And I just listed all those steps I gave you. And now I'm on to Google Earth Board. That'll be the first one I talk about. So don't worry about taking notes. You've got the video, so you can always replay it. And then I'm going to put the notes in the stream. So on the Google Earth Board, what students do is they are going to you're going to give them choices of locations to find on Google Earth. Now these can come from, here's some popular lists, locations students go to during their class, locations of the students' homes or their ancestral homeland, locations of the setting in a favorite literary book. This gives a chance to say, my favorite book is this, and this is where it's located, and then they go into Google Earth and show it. Locations of historic events or student choice, you might want to do that. So from one of these lists, this is what students pick, but only one of the lists, you decide or vote on it in class and, and come up with the list you're gonna use, and then make your sign up board for all the students to sign up and they're gonna state where they're gonna go on that list and their date. So once they're up there, they're gonna go to Google Earth I, I have a tour that I have from a, another fifth grade class, and they were wonders of the world is what they were finding. So what happens is the student will find their wonder of the world, and let's say it's Mount Kilimanjaro. And I, oh, I'm on Mount Everest. Let's just say it's Mount Everest. They're gonna search for it in Google Earth. At, at, and during the presentation, they're gonna bring Google Earth up, they're going to type in the search bar, and I don't think you can see it up here. It'll be Mount Everest. Google Earth will go there. Now I'm already there, so it's not going to go very far. And the student will say, this is Mount Everest, and then they'll give one fascinating fact about it. But here's what they're going to do while they're talking and presenting. Or before. Your older ones, they can do it while they're presenting. The younger ones, they might want to have this already prepared. 
So once you have that site, when you right click on it, you come up with properties. In here, they'll put their fascinating fact down here. Here, they can find their place mark. It can be a mountain. I know there's a mountain in here. Whatever they pick, they can use. Then say, okay. They can also, which for your older students, add a custom icon, and this could be their picture. If you go to custom icon and then browse and find the picture, and it'll bring it up, and that could be their picture. Okay, so they found their icon, they put their note in, they say, okay, and then there it is. And Every student is going to add every classmate's location to a list that they have here. Now this one is better done in groups of two or three. So one person can be doing the smart screen stuff while the other person is making the presentation and taking the questions from the audience. But that one person will then bring up the location and do the right click and add the the location and add the um, place mark and have it done. Then this will be transferred to each student's computer and they will add every group's location until they've got an entire tour by the time they're done. Then they can run the tour right here for themselves. But it has one fascinating fact, it has each location could be really fun if it's their home lens, if it's their homes, if it's places the class went during the year, then you'd want to have, this is where we went and this is why we went there. That would be in your dialog box. So you're, and, and this, like I said, is better done in groups of two or three. You, you decide so that they can um, make that work a little smoother for you. Okay, so that, that's about it on that one. Okay, the second one is the problem solving board. These are really good because it gives you a chance to cover all of those difficult problems that really stop people from liking technology. They start working on technology and then they find, I don't know how to do this and this. And once they get two or three in a one hour period, they've given up. They just don't wanna struggle anymore. So this list can take care of the most common problems students face. I get the list from here, one of these, or all of them. Collect student questions one year and use them the next year on the presentation board. So all year long, I collect what students ask or the most common things that they ask. And then I, I put those as the problem solving. Ask teachers what problems are most often stop students from proceeding in their work, whether it's iPads, Chromebooks, laptops, desktops, anything they're using. Ask parents what stops students from using their computers for homework that they're supposed to do. They're assigned homework, but something happens and they can't do it. Well, what are those somethings? And maybe those are something we can put on the list. Ask students what worries them most. Those are the kinds of problems. Now, before I go into this list, let's talk about problem solving a little bit. Problem solving is not bad. Students are going to automatically think, problems, bad, I got problems, can't solve them, bad, and, and give up. And that's why they give up. But they're not bad. And you want to start removing that onus from it. Problems are an opportunity. They're a chance for a student to use their critical thinking, their creativity, and their problem solving skills to think, okay, how, how do I do this? How have I done it in the past? What are some strategies I have for solving these problems? Let me read just a few of the things that people have said about problem solving. And you'll have this in your stream too. They're, they're very interesting. In times like this, it's good to remember that there have always been times like these. So put a little humorous spin on it. It's not the end of the world. It's not to be taken so seriously. It's the last 
the last word. No, it's kind of funny. Never try to solve all the problems at once. Make them line up for you one by one. That's a good one, too. You, now here's a good common sense one. You don't drown by falling in the water. You drown by staying there. Now, isn't doesn't that say a mouthful? Yeah, everyone falls in the water, but no one drowns unless they don't get out. That's problem solving. It is not stress that kills you. It is effective adaptation to stress that allows us to live. This is very true. Human beings, mammals, life in general faces problems, and it's their ability to solve those problems that determines how well they'll live. So we will never get rid of problems. Look at the person who has all the money, all the wealth, all the looks in the world, and they have more as many problems as anyone else. So getting rid of one problem at a time just means there's more. It's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. And this is Albert Einstein. It's problem solving is about sticking to it. You don't get three minutes to solve a problem and then, okay, you're not smart enough. We'll move on to someone else. It's about saying, okay, I've got this problem. I'm not going to quit. And Albert Einstein says that. I agree from my experience. <laughs> this is a good one from Voltaire. Decades, hundreds of years ago, no problem can stand the assault of sustained thinking. The more you think about the problem, the more creative solutions you come up with. The problem is not that there are problems. The problem is expecting otherwise and thinking that having problems is a problem. Hear, hear. That is what you want students to go away with. That it, problems aren't the problem. It's thinking that you shouldn't have them that's the problem. Because we do. We all have them. We all face them. We all solve them. Or we stay in the water and drown. So have this conversation with students. Let them know problem solving is not a bad thing. You don't want them to think it is. When you have a problem, cheer. Okay, so here are some of the problems that I've gotten. I'm not going to read them all to you, but these are 25, and they're the most common I run into in my classrooms. And it takes students through probably fifth grade to get all of these down. But we start in third grade in this problem-solving board, getting students thinking about them. Now, if you're using the technology curriculum, and if they have been using it since kindergarten, some of these are already in their toolbox, completed, checked off, done. I still put them on the list because I want students reminded. There will always be those new students to the class who don't know that if your double click doesn't work, you push enter. Students have been working on that since kindergarten. So they, but you want them, you want all those types right on the list. Okay. How do they solve these problems? Well, first talk in general terms. Here's a nice list. Common Core has a very nice list under the standards for mathematical practice of how to solve problems. They are very good, very good. But this is a kind of a truncated list. Use appropriate tools strategically. Pick the right tool and use it. Don't just pick a tool and use it. Attend to precision. Read, read closely, read deeply. Be precise about what you're doing. Make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Don't quit. Figure out what it exactly is the problem asking and then try to solve it, even if it takes longer than you think it should. You keep going. Value evidence. If you find evidence that says, okay, this is involved in my problem, value that. If you find evidence that says this didn't work, this can't be part of the problem, even though everyone thinks it is, value that. Follow those. Solve your problem. Comprehend as well as critique. Understand other perspectives. Demonstrate independence. Do it your way. Think it through. Pay attention. Value evidence and then solve it yourself. Okay, for I break this up into the younger and older students. 
because we do this from third grade on. So the younger students, really all I want them to do is have their problem that they signed up for online, give the solution and take questions. But the older students, I want them to create a how-to. It could be a screenshot, it could be a screencast. They can pick or you can pick. It can be, it, and then I want it to go into a, a collection that's either on the class blog or the class wiki, wherever you collect these sorts of things, as a problem solving page. So that then new students who just joined in fifth grade can you read that backlog of how to solve problems and independently figure out solutions. So two different ways you're going to do this. The older one with the screencast or the screenshot, that won't take any longer, but definitely then you, you, you want those students to work in a group so that you've got two or three students preparing this backup material and one working it on the smart screen during the presentation, the other doing the presentation. Okay, here's some more problem solving strategies. And at the end of the presentation, students will add it to a resource page for problem solving. And I, for older students too, I, I have give them a poll at the end and I ask them which, when they were solving their problem, what which of these strategies up here did they use? Because I'm curious. Did they guess and check? Did they refuse to say can't? Did they find a pattern? And I put them all here and I have them vote on it and to see what comes up. I'm not going to tell you what I got. I want you to figure out what you got to get. Okay, speak like a geek is vocabulary, domain specific vocabulary. I use technology and I show students this sort of thing. It's important to know domain specific vocabulary for technology. For instance, here's a how to on creating a template. This happened to be for a poetry book students were making in fourth grade. And it had words like five by seven, double click, inset, layout, template. Well, those might make sense, but they might not. So you want students to understand techie terms, template. You want them to understand those terms or they would not be able to understand these directions. That will happen to them over and over as they go through school. They will have technical explanations for how to do something and they need to understand them. So uh, let's see. Where can you get these geeky words? Kind of the same thing we went through problem solving. And um, one solution I add, they can ask family, friends, geeky siblings, you if they're in emergency, but they should never get to you because you're gonna give them this one. This is how you find a word on, on um, Google. So if I'm on Google, And I'm trying to move it down so you can see it. And I go to Google, google.com. And I put the fine icon. It starts with the word defined up here. Now students have to use their critical thinking skills and look at this and say, is this the icon I mean? A painting? Is it a person or thing regarded as a representative symbol of something? Is it a symbol or graphic representation of a screen of a program option or window? They have to look at these definitions and come up with the right one. It does not work if they say, okay, these are the four definitions. That's not what you want. You want the techie one, unless you're in art class then you want this one, number one. So you want to use that as an example for students. They can find every word by doing that sort of a definition hunt on Google, but they have to be discriminating, use their critical thinking and pick the right definition. 
Okay, so presentation, they will include the word, the definition, any roots or affixes it has, an authentic sentence that communicates the meaning to the classmate. I like that icon, does it? That could be anything. I click the icon to open the program, that does it. Share personal experience using the words, define the word in context, and show care choosing words and phrases so the definition is clear. Okay, so that's speak like a geek. Now, and that's our three boards. A lot of material covered in those, but they're all related to other things you're talking about. To your vocabulary lessons, to speaking and listening, to research, it's that quick research, it's strategic tools. So they're all related to different things that you're doing. All right. I will post this on our stream as soon as I get it pulled together so it's a little more comprehensible. And feel free to give me any questions you have. All right, guys. Have a great week. Talk to you later.